like full of energy for an entire day of GraphQL. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> no, I mean, I, that was like two, two people right here. So can we, like, let's, let's try it in, in sections. So like from, from this half here, are you guys awake? Yeah. And then on this half over here, are you all awake? No. <laughs> I mean, number wise. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's, that's fair, so um, let's, uh, let's do a little warm up here as everybody's kind of coming in. We'll give it a little bit of a train strike buffer here. So uh, let's see here, who thinks they traveled the furthest to get here today? Okay, so how, from where? Israel, Israel. ooh, okay, that's gonna be a, a tough one. Over here we had one, yeah? Australia, Australia. oh, <laughs> yeah, and then, but I, but I don't know, I don't know. Because we're from China. <laughs> China, and we're in China because China is massive. So in Shenzhen, South China. So that's hard to tell because the thing like curves, and I'm not quite sure. Do either of you know like geography? I'm an American, so like I've, once it goes past like Chicago, I'm lost. So okay, and one more person. Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. All right. Well, this is very this is very close. So. All right, either way, we have actually a lot of GraphQL representation in the room. Um, I wanna go ahead and uh, do a little intro here, and I'm gonna ask a couple more questions. How many people are using GraphQL currently in production in their company? That's actually pretty good. Uh, we have you know, sleepy numbers this morning, so that's almost half the room. Uh, how many people are using GraphQL on a test basis and are interested in what's going on? Okay, actually more, that's good. And how many people, this is gonna be your very first GraphQL talk? Oh, wow. Whoa, all right, great. Normally I have to skip the first half of my slides, so this is actually gonna be great today. Uh, about me, I am a developer advocate for Graph CMS. We are a headless CMS, and we focus entirely on GraphQL. If you have questions about what a headless CMS is, find me during one of the breaks. I'm happy to talk your ear off about that. I am a husband and I am a father, which means that I do tell terrible dad jokes. So I will probably give you evidence of that here shortly, but just be fair, uh, be warned. I'm also an American, as you can probably tell, so I talk English a little bit fast, especially when standing on stage. So if I'm going too fast for the audience, just give me one of these panic signs and I'll totally try to slow down. Give me one of these signs and I will I'll stop the dad jokes. All right, what we're gonna cover today, basically what GraphQL is, the problems it is solving, and how to get started. This is the intro and welcome to GraphQL talk, all right? And we will have more in-depth talks coming up, but this is one that will hopefully get everybody caught up and on the same page, you'll, you'll hear what the same terms are and that we'll all be able to go forward with lots of education today. Uh, brief GraphQL timeline, so basically 2012, Facebook is ready to revamp their mobile applications. And they were like, okay, this whole web view thing was a, was a fiasco, let's go native. And they realized they had a problem that they just had way too much data being shipped down the, down the wire. They had massive J, uh, JSON documents that were just uh, bogging up the, the network. And so they go ahead and they release that and they say, you know, data's hard, let's go ahead and make a system that allows us to be more specific about the data we require. In uh, 2015, they open source it. Kind of, if you're familiar with the open source licensing situation behind some of Facebook's software. Uh, it was kind of a catch and release. Uh, I'm not quite sure how you would best describe it, but it was not a full open source situation. The community caught on slowly, or not caught on, but sort of protested a little bit. 2017-ish, they uh, started to switch that over. And in 2018, uh, we have the GraphQL Foundation. GraphQL is now completely independent. It is part of the Linux Foundation. So the first thing up, GraphQL is a solution, and it's primarily a solution to solve the problem with data. Data evolves. You have uh, static models that you expect to be relatively consistent from the time that you define the, the core type, and then at some point that data starts to shift, and what it needs to support starts to shift. Five years ago, you would not be actually wondering if this new vehicle you wanted to buy was allowed to drive in a major European city. Today it's a question. Data means different things to different devices. So data in context of a VR unit is totally different than VR or than data in an audio only context. 
and uh, relationships are messy, as we can all attest to. Uh, this is a typical relational um, schema here, and you can just see the lines going all over the place. It's, it's difficult to organize this and to, and to structure this in a way that is uh, meaningful. Data infrastructure often suffers from bloat. So this is a contrived example, if you can't tell. Uh, so we have you know, the typical REST-ish kind of framework that was designed to support every possible edge case of your content, but maybe you don't actually need that much structure for your project. I uh, added a croissant there for scale, just so you can get some context. No, no, no laughs, come on. The jokes, okay, I got one of these, all right, so we'll, keep, we'll skip on, all right. Uh, <laughs> We have uh, out of sync data domain and API architecture. This one happens the most often. When you started, this is roughly how it was supposed to look. You had this idea, this is where the content's gonna go, this is the business model we have, this is the domain that we wanna, we wanna support, and then within two or three uh, iterations, new features, everything else, the structure you supported and the way the business is going are now completely out of sync with each other. It's also difficult to target the needed data. We have the classic overfetching, underfetching problem that is used extensively in GraphQL conversations. What you actually intended to target would be this little piece of the, of the plant here, and what you get is the entire thing. This is the, the Facebook problem that they were trying to solve initially. They wanted to have just you know uh, critical path data for their mobile application, and they were getting nested levels of data that was just uh, too large to support. Or you have the underfetching. You intended to get the entire tree, and what you actually have to do is you start with the stem, and then you get, okay, here are your leaf IDs, and then you have to iterate over each of those IDs to get the full leaf. And yeah, data is difficult. Basically, with GraphQL, it allows you to tell me what you want, what you really, really want, which makes it great. Okay. Uh, so Scary Spice uh, aligns better with French people than I do, so, well, there you go. All right, uh, GraphQL is a specification. Moving on to more concrete examples, it is comprised of types. These types allow you to define what you want to actually support inside of your data model. We have six official named types, scalar, object, interface, union, enum, and input objects. We have two wrapping types, because by default they are all nullable, and so you can say that this type is supposed to be non-null, and you can also say this is a list item. And then you can extend any of those base six types uh, to create whatever else you would want to support. Put all those types together into a single document and you have a schema. And this is where you define the entire scope or domain of the data you want to support. We have two operation types, and this, or three operation types, and you have the query, which allows you to do your read operations, and then you have, muta you have the mutation, which supports the update and delete operations. Subscription is not currently actually uh, standardized in the specification. There are a few players like Amazon and Apollo that have their own implementation of that, but uh, it's not yet currently uh, standardized in the specification, so uh, buyer beware. Is so everybody staying caught up at this point? Everybody good? All right. One of the nice things about it being a specification is that there are spec promises that actually are delivered with that. First of all, that all APIs, if they are spec compliant, can be introspected. And introspection is one of the most powerful features of GraphQL. It means that with a single request, I can actually understand the entire domain of what you are supporting. I can understand all your types, what they support, how they're connected, and this enables incredibly powerful tooling, which is one of the things that has led developers to embrace GraphQL so quickly, is this introspection query. We're gonna have a talk at the end of the day where you're gonna see introspection magic. So if, you, if you're not tracking with me now, definitely come at the end of the day because it's just an, a, an amazing talk for the last one we have today. There will all be good talks, but the last one is really a very, um, it's, it's well worth the watch. I, I, I've seen it before and do come back. Uh, another spec promise, uh, the order is, uh, the response is ordered. So if you are writing in a language that respects order, JavaScript's kind of a, a fake order system, um, but if you have an actual true res ordered response system, that's actually nice to be able to know that your response will come back in an ordered fashion. And the whole schema is strongly typed, which means that if you are implementing a GraphQL uh, backend and you have a TypeScript or a type checker on the front end, you're able to actually have uh, type safety all the way through. The next and uh, two talks, Carlos will be giving us a lot about the benefits of uh, type safety throughout. 
GraphQL is a query language. This is probably visibly what most people think of when they hear of GraphQL. And this is kind of what it looks like. This is the syntax of how you would request data from a GraphQL endpoint. What you have initially is you have the uh, an ability to have an alias here. So this little piece on the top, that's uh, called an alias. You can change the keyed response you get from the server. Next up, you have the input, uh, the type that you're actually querying, in this case, beer. And then you have the input type, which allows you to run special operations in your resolver. So you would say, I want to filter based on uh, the flavor, or I want to key a specific object, grab it by an ID. Then you have the fields that are actually supported on those types to be responded. And these are, then this is another nested type. This is where the real power of GraphQL comes into play, is that you actually are able to uh, nest any uh, number of depths about what you want to have for rela uh, related data. Um, that's, there are some pitfalls with that, like you could definitely have a, a recursive pattern, and a lot of tooling today has, uh, has specific catches in place to avoid that, but it's something that you do want to keep in mind. Essentially, uh, GraphQL is a query language for traversing graph relationships while maintaining readability and declarative style. Not everybody agrees with this point, but this is one that I personally find uh, relevant. To me, this is uh, highly readable. I find that to be just a very beautiful angle about it. if you're onboarding new users or new developers to your system and you're querying data, they can understand exactly what data you're requesting, and they can kind of grok the idea of what, of what a query is really quickly. And I've seen that in our company countless times where we have a new person coming in, oftentimes even new to development, and they see this, and they go, oh, yeah, I, I see what's going on here. And that's actually a really powerful uh, angle as well. So why does this, all this matter? Well, essentially, data is, again, different things in different contexts. You can deliver the same base content to a visual target or to an audio target, and why would you ever want to send all your images and graphics and everything else down to uh, a Google Hub when that's just excess data? So we can be very targeted in the data that we're requesting, and we can be able to say, this device needs uh, slimmed down content and not the, the whole scope of everything that we, we support. Uh, GraphQL is an execution engine. So this is the part that most people don't really realize. So the essential flow here is you receive a query, and then you will validate that with the schema that you define, all the types that you put together. So the, the query comes in as the payload to a request to your API. It validates that, says, is this, a valid, uh, is this a valid request? And then if so, it then gives you the resolve, you have resolvers that then will take, uh, fetch that data from whatever system you have in the back end. And that in is actually one of the most promising futures for GraphQL because what's, what's implicit here is that this is technology agnostic. Nowhere in the specification does it say how you have to implement this. You can do, as long as it supports these base features, you can write this in whatever you want. You can resolve SOAP data. You can resolve anything you could possibly want. And GraphQL essentially then becomes a query language for your APIs. And this is something that's really going to be its sort of uh, second stage. There's a lot of context where it makes sense to be your primary data resolver and to, to fetch your front end content. But it also can be a, a system that allows your back end systems to talk to each other in a way that they both understand. And this is something that is really popular really powerful about GraphQL. Um, lastly, wrapping it up here, um, GraphQL is a community. And if you uh, take a look at the, what we discussed earlier, the GraphQL Foundation, so there's lots of ways to get involved, everything from documentation to even just feedback about this is something that I didn't understand. This is, this is still early phase for a lot of the uh, foundation work. And so you can get involved in any number of possible ways. There are meetups happening all around the world for Graph, uh, GraphQL. We have the Hong Kong founder for GraphQL meetup uh, speaking today. It's really a fantastic community to be involved with. It's very open. Everybody is really excited about it. And there's a lot of companies that are embracing it. I highly recommend the one in the middle. Um, but really, uh, there's a lot of companies that are doing amazing things with GraphQL. Uh, Apollo, for example, which is this one here, they didn't, they didn't get a little text byline for me, but they, they create amazing tooling uh, for the GraphQL community. And so this is just a, there's a lot of rich companies that are just giving a lot of free resources and helping this spec grow a little bit. 
Are we doing on time here? Let me just take a quick look. We're doing fine. Very good. All right, I'm going to give you a little demo about what a GraphQL API kind of looks like in practice. So this is the tool that we create. It doesn't really matter. It's, um, it could be any of these other tools that I mentioned. What we have here is essentially the types that we're supporting. So in this case, we have a destination type, we have a hotel type, and we have a review type, uh, rather uh, simplistic in, in structure. And then the fields that we wanted to support here along the, along the side. And what happens then is, so we, ha we can kind of preview how that content looks if we just open up one of these guys here. Um, we have just uh, yeah, photos and titles, locations, description, standard items. This is a, a hotel uh, travel site. If we go ahead and uh, actually look at the magic then behind it, we can run a query and be able to get very specific data we would want. So this is how GraphQL syntax comes into play. Because of the introspection query, we have the ability to explore all of the data here on the side. So I can start to drill down and understand everything that this specific schema supports. I can see the reviews. I can see which types it takes. I can see which input types that it takes. And this is a very powerful feature. I get all that for free. This is not documentation. I, people will often say, I think I've even said it before in talks, uh, that, that you get free documentation with uh, your GraphQL API. This is not documentation, but it is really helpful uh, if you need to, to find out what you're wanting to work with. Let's go ahead and run this in practice. Uh, the graphical is this interface we're working with today. It's one of these tools that supports introspection. One of the nice things about it is that it supports autocomplete. So I can just simply do a quick uh, uh, shortcut here, option spacebar, and I can see all the types that I, that I have available. So we're going to go ahead and grab a destination as the top type. And I will look down here, grab a name off of that. I will grab a location. I'm going to see what hotels I have available. And we'll go ahead and grab another name on there, see how many rooms it has available. And I see that I have a problem already. That's, I'm grabbing destination, which is a singular element in, in our system that requires an ID. I want to grab destinations, which now becomes a list type, or as a, as a my type with a, a list wrapper. And I could see that, I could tell that I had an error there because it gave me the little uh, Microsoft Word red squiggly line. And that's just another benefit of this type checking that we support. So I'm going to go ahead and run this and hope that the uh, conference Wi-Fi smiles kindly upon me today. Looks like it's struggling. We're going to like see what happens here. Hey, we got data. So uh, I can actually uh, view all the data that I have. It's all great. I can run an input type on this as well. And I'll say I'm going to skip the, or I'm going to grab the first uh, two of these here and limit it down. So it's a very expressive language to work with. Um, Grassy Mess, I think, is a really fantastic way to get started with this kind of a system. It allows you to really quickly and, and uh, descriptively build types in a way that is helping you uh, break out of code if you wanted to more visually build your schema. Uh, so it's a really fast way to get started, and we have free developer accounts. But it's, this is GraphQL. This is how GraphQL works. This is how you, you find your types, and you run a query, and you have the data that you need just like that. So if I go back to my slides here. Um, oh, speaking of the, of the Graph CMS, if you would like, this is a free coupon for you all. So feel free to take a photo of this for later. It's two free months of any single plan that you would want on our system. So feel free to grab that. I will also have it available with me on my phone, so you can get that as well later. I'll give you a couple of minutes, because there's a lot of phones going up. <laughs> Everybody got it? Anybody need two more minutes, one minute? It's good. Checking time here. Feeling pretty good, confident, good. All right, good. Uh, if, you need, if you need access to it, definitely just ping me, and, I will, and I'll be happy to give that to you. Uh, so as I wrap this up here and move on to our first talker for the day, uh, stay curious. Sorry, one last dad joke there. I had, a, had to toss that in there. Uh, ways to get started. So our own documentation is supposed to be a really great way to get started. I have wrote a lot of those. Uh, our, our team is really actively looking for feedback on how to make that better. So if you need some more information, please let us know. Uh, you can also reach out to us on our chat bubble. We are happy to point you to directions where to go as well. GraphQL.org is the definitive place on how to get started. There's links to free education courses. There's links to all kinds of resources on there to get started and to read more. 
Um, it has a link to the specification as well, and like, it's not that complex to read. It's actually fairly straightforward, and if you can understand that, you know as much as anybody in the system right now. And then how to GraphQL is just a really great learning resource as well for getting started. So with that, I just want to say, Welcome to GraphQL. I'm really excited for this uh, for the chats today. We're going to have some really amazing talks. Again, I really encourage you to stay all the way through. Uh, in particular, that last talk is just going to be a real uh, fun way to wrap up the evening. We'll have type safety chats. We'll have actual real uh, real world use cases today. Um, everything imaginable. And with that, I'm actually not going to take questions because we have a whole bunch of fantastic speakers which will be answering most of those. If you have questions, do find me afterwards and I will be happy to help you. I will be one of your MCs today, so you'll see my face quite a bit. And we will hopefully all learn something really valuable. So our first talk today is actually from Andre Los, and he will give us a client's eye view, the reason, facts, and numbers about GraphQL.